Okay, well, welcome. I think we should get started. And yeah. um, again, thank you and welcome. Glad you could join us today for this very first presentation of um, De-Stress RX, uh, which is really a novel uh, customized uh, kind of program, which you've seen, I'm sure, if you've taken it. And we did ask that you take the De-Stress RX assessment before the session so that you could have some of your questions ready. And uh, again, my name is Bud Wassell, and I know a lot of you. Um, I know you've come to some of my classes, and so it's great to see you all. So uh, welcome, and, um, and hope you're having a great day. And as you know, I've taught mindfulness and stress-related classes before to system employees. But when I came across this particular one um, that, that Paul is going to present on today, De-Stress Rx, I think you'll see that it's really quite different, and it kind of brought up for me the idea. Get over that, here! Come on. If, if everybody could put themselves on mute, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so the idea that we all respond to stress in different ways, and we see that especially in our own environment and the kinds of different jobs that we have, but even just from our own backgrounds, our own family backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, the way that we've dealt with stress in the past. Thank you for, if I mute everybody. So I've muted everybody at this point. Paul, when you start, you're going to have to unmute yourself. But um, so anyway, that's the, the reason uh, this is such a, uh, an interesting approach and we did ask you to take the assessment before the class today, so hopefully you did that and you've got your particular unique um, or one of the 16 uh, personality styles <clears throat> as, and has how do you relate to stress, some of the triggers and symptoms, but more importantly, the strategies. And uh, so that's really kind of what this is about and, and can think of it as a springboard. There may be other things that we can do or we can offer you want to remind you about our employee and family resources program <laughs> that's the that's my main job i'm coordinator of that program and that's our eap service that provides um direct one-to-one -one counseling which these days is is mostly <laughs> done um by telehealth but you can uh, request face-to-face -face. we are doing that again and that's just part of the service is the the direct counseling that we provide which of course can be very helpful for stress related things but there's a range of other services, including our website. And, um, you know, if you need information on that, reach out to me. But you can also find information on employee and family resources on Drive, <clears throat> but also on Infor. There's links on both those um, intranet sites on the program. So that's where you can get direct information on EFR. So um, as we said, if you can and if you're able to put your video on. We'd love to see your faces and some of you there have done that and we appreciate that. We're gonna leave you on mute for now, but um, we do wanna make this interactive. So once we get going, I'll let Paul mm -hmm. kind of control that in terms of when he would like your input, but you could use the chat uh, to do that. I'll be monitoring the chat sort of as the host of this webinar. And, um, you know, I'll try to get your, if you have a specific question, we'll try to get that answered for you from, from Paul, who is the expert. And um, so let me introduce Paul Teeger is the founder and CEO of Speed Reading People, LLC, uh, a principal of iConnect Health. I'm an internationally recognized expert in personality psychology. Paul's the author of five best-selling books, including The Art of Speed Reading People, and Do What You Are, uh, which have sold over a million copies. Paul also has concluded, or rather conducted, the most robust research to date, five studies with over 50,000 subjects, which showed a strong correlation between personality type and medication adherence, uh, physician-patient communication and major health risks, including anxiety, depression, alcohol abuse, smoking, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, and stress. So as you can see, uh, really important stuff as to you know, what our personalities are. And so I won't say anything more about it other than to say it's really been a pleasure working with Paul so far, getting ready for these. He's really very, he is the expert on this. He's very knowledgeable. 
So I'll turn it over to Paul. And um, and again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Paul. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's all welcome you. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all because I know you have other other places you could be. So I'm hoping that the next 45, 50 minutes will be um, enlightening and useful on a very practical level. So I don't have to go through my background, but you did a very nice job of that. Thank you for those very nice words. <clears throat> what I'd like to do today in the time we have is to introduce you to a tool that I created that I think can have a big impact on people's stress level. And um, one of the things that I've uh, discovered, let me, let me bring up my screen here <clears throat> and um, get that right. Um, here we go. Okay, so here we are. And again, thank you so much for your willingness to put your mugs up there on the screen. It's it's challenging being being a presenter on Zoom, but it's it makes it a lot more enjoyable and and helpful when you can't see people. <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce you to a, a system I created, tool I created, um, in response specifically to COVID, uh, because as you all know, this is a this is a, this has been an unprecedented time of enormous stress continues to be. We're not out of the woods yet. And uh, unfortunately, healthcare professionals have, have been affected, I think, more than anybody else. So I'm, I'm pleased to have been able to create this. I'm You're here. I'm eager to share this with you. And um, so I'll just do this kind of intro quickly and, and just remind you that, you know, if we had more time, I'd be happy to take questions along the way. The I can hear it. The reality is trying to kind of squeeze this into 45, 50 minutes just does not leave me a lot of time to do that. I hope we'll have some time at the end. I would be happy to leave Bud my email address and, um, and sincerely offer if anybody's got questions afterward to please reach out to me, I'd be happy to respond to them. So everything's blown up as a result of COVID, anxiety, depression, alcohol, substance abuse, all kinds of physical and psychological issues. Um, and the reality is when it comes to reducing stress, one size does not fit all. A strategy that'll work well with one person will have the opposite effect on somebody else. So de-stress and rex is something I created to be quick, easy, and customized to each individual. The, 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 um, the strategies that I know having done this for a very, very long time and having been showing the research, my research that I've done, um, are the things that people are most likely to actually do and those are the things that most likely to work. So the scientific foundation of this is called the Young-Myers model. I call it the Young-Myers model. Some of you might know it as Myers-Briggs, MBTI. Um, it's a model that's been around a long time, used by 89 of the Fortune 100 companies. The studies I did, as Bud alluded to, um, have been over five, five studies with over 50,000 subjects. And if any of you are researchers, you'll know that is a very big N. Um, and that's because there are a lot of personality types, it's important to me to, to get a big N to make sure that there are enough people of different types to be able to extrapolate the data <clears throat> in a useful way. So we uh, found a very strong correlation between anxiety and depression, which of course leads to stress or is an influence on stress as well as other um, health risk factors, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So what I wanna introduce you to quickly first is the idea of temperament. And what I think of temperament as four different human natures. In my books, I call traditionalists, people who are, uh, whose core value is responsibility. Steady, eddy, solid, dependable, reliable. They do what they're supposed to do. Um, the, the symbol there is a little checkbox because these folks make lists, they check things off, they get things done, that's what makes them feel good. There's a second group of people, which I call experiencers, and they're about 27% of the population. Traditionalists are almost half the population. And these people are very different. Experiencers are all about squeezing out as much life and enjoyment as they can. Um, so they're more spontaneous, more impulsive. They're not necessarily rule followers. I'll get into this in a minute. The third group, <clears throat> which I call conceptualizers, are only 10% of the population, but their core, core value really is success. Success, knowledge, competence. Um, and then the last group, which I call idealists, are the people that are all about meaning. Now, nobody is exclusively these characteristics, but everybody is primarily. This is innate stuff. This is what you're born with. Your temperament doesn't change. In my judgment, having done this for over 40 years, doesn't really change with each situation you're in. Here's a little deeper dive here. The traditionalists, responsible, dependable, reliable, hardworking, 
strong work ethic, detail oriented. They do what they're supposed to do, follow the rules. Uh, they go for checkups when they're supposed to. Um, they rotate their tires, they pay their taxes. I was a jury consultant for 25 years. They come and show up for jury duty. They don't try to get out of it. These are people that are sort of the bedrock. And a lot of people in healthcare are traditionalists. Even though there's 46% of the population, it's probably 75% of healthcare professionals are traditionalists. Because you got a lot of protocol you got to follow. You, got, you, know, you can't decide, you know, I should give them this med now, or maybe I'll give them the med a little later. No, you got to do what you're supposed to be doing. Um, experiencers tend to be fun loving, practical, uh, and live life to the fullest, adaptable, spontaneous. They really enjoy their lives. They tend to be risk takers as well, and not people who necessarily like to follow the rules or be told what to do. And they're almost a third of the population. Third group, as I mentioned, <clears throat> conceptualizers, 10%, but they're really all about competence and knowledge, um, intellectual pursuits, com competition. They're very strategic. Um, they are 10% of the population, but probably 80% of people who are in leadership positions, whether it's the local food bank or whether it's, you know, um, Google. People that are uh, conceptualizers have this big vision, which is the intuition part and logic, which is thinking, which makes them people who are really driven to, um, to have big ideas and implement them. And the last people, the idealists, are people who are empathetic, perceptive, often spiritual, they're good communicators, they're compassionate. These are the, fun, the, the kind of seekers, searchers uh, of life. What is life all about? How do I actualize? How do I become the best person I can be? And they're about 17% of the population, but if I showed you type tables of therapists, they're probably 85% of therapists are these 17% people. It's because they're driven to understand what makes people tick and driven to help them become as, as, um, as healthy as they can be. So the four main groups that we're gonna talk about are traditionalists, experiencers, conceptualizers, and idealists. And every one of you falls into one of these buckets. So that's sort of the super bucket. That's the human nature. And then below that um, are personality types that go with each of these, you know, so there's four per personality types that go with traditionalists, there's four personality types that go with experiencers, four for conceptualizers, and four for idealists. And that's why when you, the reports that you got, your de-stress Rx, show um, your specific four letter personality type. So I don't want to confuse you, but that's a more granular cut. I'll get into that in, in a few minutes. Um, if you have questions along the way, um, put them in the chat, and, and um, if it's something I can respond to, because I don't want to lose anybody, then um, I'd be happy to do that. So I wanted to spend just a couple minutes trying to make these different temperaments come alive with a few cartoons that I think do a good job. So traditionalists are serious, strong work ethic. On the third day of vacation, I began to relax. Um, I can't see your faces. I hope there's a couple of smiles there. Um, if you're one of these people and you sort of know what I mean, usually take work with you on your vacation. Uh, it's hard to break away. Um, maybe it's more than, than some other types. They tend to be down to earth and no nonsense. Ed Wagner is just a real meat and potatoes guy. No fluff, no frills. What you see is what you get. Their word is their bond. Uh, they say they're going to do something, they do it. When it comes to experiencers, they're a very different breed of cat. They like excitement, jump into new experiences. <clears throat> well, is there life on the other side or not? See, this goldfish is sort of impulsive. That's why this is a humorous cartoon. Okay. Um, and they like to live in the moment and take risks. Calm down, Sylvia. Calm down. Where's your spirit of adventure? Guy's got a sign that says anywhere. So this is not something that the traditionalists would entertain, stopping for this guy. When we're talking about conceptualizers, they're really success career driven. Well, of course I wanna grow as a person, but first I wanna grow as a banker. And these are folks who, one of the reasons they get so far up the food chain is because they are so driven to comp for competence and knowledge and um, that's what makes them uh, good leaders. They're often gifted problem solvers as well. 
Well, here's your problem, Mr. Schuler. I'll give you a second to kind of absorb that one. It's a very intuitive cartoon, but this is Gary Larson. I don't know if you remember him, but he was a great, great cartoonist. Um, idealists are empathetic. We, we want to be helpful. That's why there's so many of us who are in healthcare and counselors. Calm down, Edna. Yes, it's some giant hideous insect, but it could be some giant hideous insect in need of help. Again, a little Gary Larson humor for you. And we are people pleasers, but often soft touches. Spare armadillo man, spare armadillo. Guy's going, uh oh, how am I going to get by this guy? Because he's got a spare armadillo. Okay, maybe it's better that I don't see your faces. Okay. All right, so that gives you just a quick look at these four temperaments. Um, and as we go through them, go through this presentation, uh, hopefully that'll become clear to you which one, <clears throat> which bucket you sort of fit into. So this is interesting. This is a research I did at the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. And there was 10,000 people in this, 10,500 people in this study, scientific study, randomized and stratified and represented, representative. And you looked at these risk factors, medication non-adherence, anxiety, depression, alcohol abuse, smoking, lack of exercise, poor nutrition, sleep issues. And the traditionalists, right, only accounted for about 5% of health risk factors. And why is that? Because they do what they're supposed to do. Come for checkups, take the medication. One of the things that the first study I did was about medication adherence with 16,700 people. And we showed a very strong relationship between people who take medication and people who don't. And this is your field. You know that about half the people that are prescribed medications, only about half of those people take those. But these are not the people that don't take them. These are the people that do take them. When we're talking about experiencers, every single one of these risk factors um, they had. They're about 27% 27 of the population, but almost half the all risk factors. And if we pull, you know, if the health plans pull the numbers, the claim data on this, my guess is that experiencers are probably responsible for 70 or 80 percent of the health care costs. Because we know that, you know, if you're pre-diabetic and if you manage it, it's not going to be nearly as horrible, but also as expensive. But if you don't and you become full-blown type 2 diabetic, then the, the costs skyrocket. Conceptualizers only had two health risk factors, alcohol and poor nutrition. And then when I looked at the idealists, the, um, there was anxiety, depression, alcohol abuse, and sleep issues. So they're all behavioral issues. I went back to my researchers and said, hmm, this is a really interesting finding. Can we do another study where we do a deeper dive just on anxiety and depression? And that's what I want to show you now. So Paul, quick yeah. question sure. um, from uh, one of the participants. Can we have a combination of these temperaments? You don't have a combination of temperaments. You have a combination of characteristics. In other words, you know, there's traditionally, this relates to most people. It's not about individuals, right? Every individual is unique. So the reality is most traditionalists act this way. Of course, there are some who don't. And personality is really a combination of nature and nurture. This is the nature stuff, your inborn personality. The nurturing is all the other stuff that happens to you. The parents you're born with, it's the location, you know, geography, the cultural stuff, your ethnic background. So all those can have an impact. So you can have, for example, an experiencer who by nature is not a person who's very adherent, but has parents who are like, you know, rule the roost with an iron fist and really instill all these values. So that individual might not have these risk factors, but in general, people do. I'm hoping that's, that's a clarification. Okay. So um, I started saying before that with each of these temperaments, there's a personality type. So for example, with traditionalists, there's what's called extrovert sensing, thinking, judging types, introvert sensing, thinking, judging types, extrovert sensing, feeling, judging types, and introvert sensing, feeling, judging. You don't have to know, you don't have to memorize this. Um, on your de-stress RX, 
it will have produced a report for each of those types. So it's more specific than just your temperament. I hope you're following that. So with experiencers, there are four different types. With conceptualizers, there's four different types. And with idealists, there's four different types. So when you look at your report, it might not necessarily say these characteristics of traditionalists, experiencers, conceptualizers, idealists, but it will be specific to who you are, which is much more granular. So it's much more specific to you. So here's something that got a lot of people's attention. This is um, using a, a screen of the PHQ-4, which is what you use in, in a lot of doctor's offices and, and with therapists. It measures depression. These are results from the 16 different personality types in the survey. And so starting, the, the ones in green are ones who are less likely to suffer from anxiety, I'm sorry, depression. And the ones in red are much more likely to suffer from a depression. So for example, this type over here, it's an introvert, sensing, thinking, judging type, right? 25% less likely to suffer from depression. But if you go all the way over here, this introvert, intuitive, feeling, perceiving type is 41% more likely to. So you notice that all four of the traditionalist temperaments are in this group, and all four of the idealist types are in this group. So does this mean that people who are introvert, intuitive, feeling, perceiving types, or INFPs are doomed or destined to be depressed? No, it doesn't. It means there's a proclivity, there's a greater likelihood, in this case, a much greater likelihood, because these are people who are very thoughtful, introspective, they sensitive, empathetic, they worry about a lot of stuff, and the world is a pretty, well, I'm sorry, the world is a, uh, Sorry about that. Let me get this over here. The world is a pretty challenging place today. So there's a lot to worry about. So Paul, yep. if I may, related yep. to that, there's another question. And I think this kind of relates to the last, this slide and the last one. And the question is, if I look at risk factors and which checks box, checked boxes fit me, yep. is that where I go into that category? I think that's, um, that's a great question. In other words, you're saying, is this a way to figure out who you are? I yeah, think I think that's what the question means. Yeah. Um, well, I've never backed into it that way. I don't think it's, you know, it's not, the science is, has not been proven that um, all experiencers are likely to have this, you know, medication non adherence but in general, experiencers are much more likely to so the reality is it could be a backdoor way into figuring out your type and your temperament, but I don't want to represent that as the way. The assessment that you took, by the way, is over 90% accurate. It only took you three minutes, right? But it's over 90% accurate compared to the Myers-Briggs, which is a class B psychological test. It takes about a half hour. It's supposed to be administered by a licensed practitioner, and it's only about 76% accurate. So thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. And if the person who asked that or anyone else, again, wants to get in touch with me and have a longer discussion, I'm more than willing to do that. So um, this is depression. Let's look at anxiety. Um, it's not terribly dissimilar, right? Again, 10,500 people. And um, these folks are much less likely to be anxious. These people much more likely, in this case, uh, this INFP is 49% more likely than their percentages in the population to be to uh, have anxiety. So this really got my attention, um, and I'm hoping to get a lot of people's attention with it. And the last one I'll show you about this is that these are the proportions of types who suffer extreme or severe anxiety and depression. And look at these numbers. Again, mostly the same people. Um, who have less, less severe anxiety and depression. And these folks over here are 86% more likely. So if you're a person who happens to be an INFP, it doesn't mean this is your destiny. It just means that um, you need to pay attention to that. You probably already pay attention to it. And if you have children who are INFP, it's helpful to know that early on so that you can get them the kind of, you know, uh, counseling and, and educational advantages that they, they might benefit from. 
So uh, questions before I move on to the next section, are there, are there other questions while I'm here? Nothing in the chat right now, but um, if, anybody have a question right now based on what Paul has been asking, talking about? Sometimes it takes yep. people no worries. typing in, but. No worries, we're doing okay. Alrighty, I'm gonna move on then. Um, you can come back if you like. So what I wanna talk about now is um, some of the, the so common uh, triggers for symptoms and success strategies for each of the four temperament groups, right? And what I'm about to show you is really a summary. It's not specific because the specific advice and information is on your, your own de-stress Rx, but this is sort of an orientation um, based on the temperament stuff. Um, you know, some people think this COVID stuff is gone. Well, I'm not one of those guys. And, um, it's, you know, it's very much alive and variants, new variants, as you know, as healthcare professionals are popping up all the time. So the stress is not going away. It's only gonna keep going. Um, so it's most important to know, I think, what are the things that are most likely to stress you? What does that look like when you get stressed? And um, most important, um, what are some strategies that you can use based on who you are? So we talked about traditionalists and the core value for them is responsibility. So some of the common triggers for um, traditionalists are loss of control and uncertainty. Now, if, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that we are not in control of pretty much anything, right? I mean, anyone who thinks they're in charge, in control, uh, they're sort of, maybe they're, maybe they're more in denial. Um, so while everyone likes to be in control and everyone likes certainty, this is a really big treasure, I'm, I'm sorry, big trigger, more common trigger for traditionalists because this is so important for them to have. And they like to know what's coming down the road. You know, these are folks that lay out their clothes the night before. You know, they've got their vacations planned six months in advance. <clears throat> they have all these, you know, their calendars or as soon as they have an obligation or something, it's in the calendar. So these are people who really, really like certainty and really are stressed by uncertainty. So what does it look like? Well, people who really value doing a good job and having a strong work ethic, sometimes they're not able to do their job as well as they used to do. They don't have the resources uh, early on in the pandemic, especially, you know, working from home or, work, or working into, you know, walking into a situation where you might need to um, take care of a patient in a certain way, but you know you can't do that anymore. You can't hold that person's hand because they're on a ventilator or you can't um, help the person's family because they're not allowed into the hospital. I'm just using some, some general examples that I know sort of from the news. So what that can do is to make traditionalists feel that they're not doing a, as good enough job as they should, or lack of self-worth. They can feel guilty for that. They can feel shame. This is not a rational process. They've got nothing to feel guilty or shame about, but these are some of the reactions um, that are typical for, um, uh, for traditionalists um, in terms of symptoms. Um, they can also feel you know, hypersensitive. They can feel like a victim. They can get uncharacteristically emotional. They can start to obsess over details. Um, they can have trouble getting organized and motivated because what's happening is people are in what we call the grip, which is sort of the grip of, of, of anxiety or, or stress, um, which is you're sort of not yourself. If you're yourself, you don't have that kind of, those kind of problems. When you're not yourself, uh, this, these are the kind of things that manifest. And what do we do? to what I call restore equilibrium, to get our balance back. Well, the antidote for traditionalists is to be productive. And that doesn't mean you're gonna be able to do everything the way you've always done it, but to be productive, even in small matters, to take on projects in the house or whatever that you can manage. You've been waiting to you know, clean out the garage for five years. This might be the time to do it because you can actually do something and see a result. You're moving this garbage over here, you're organizing the shelves and you're throwing a bunch of stuff out. There's some closure to that. There's something that you can control and that feels pretty good. Um, for, for traditionalists, 
Um, volunteering for organizations, if, there's, if that fits into your life, can be very helpful as well. Um, upping your game, increasing your commitment to church, synagogue, mosque, um, service organizations, because traditionalists really live to serve. And if you're not able to serve as well as you normally are, then you find finding other venues to do that can really help restore your equilibrium. And physical exercise is really important for these folks. So those are some of the, um, some of the triggers, symptoms, and success strategies that traditionalists um, experience. And again, it'll be, it'll be different, more granular, more specific for different types of traditionalists. People who are more extroverted have more of this, people who are more introverted have more of that, et cetera. Um, before I leave traditionalists, any questions? Any questions from traditionalists maybe? There is one question that's related to the um, types you went over, and it um, so based on the test, this person says they fall into the idealistic idealist yep. category. Yep. When you mentioned the characteristics in the beginning, yep. I feel I am more of a traditionalist with some of the idealist characteristics, which is more accurate the test or my opinion based on your description? Great question. And I would say this, if you, um, if that person uh, is willing to share the four letter type they came out, if they took the assessment, the four letter type, um, uh, here's what I would say. Um, if you're looking at the de-stress RX, I'm, ass I'm assuming this person took the assessment, not just going from the PowerPoint. If they learned yeah, from she the just, She did just, it's, she's E-N-F- J. Okay, so if she's an ENFJ, which stands for extrovert, intuitive, feeling, judging type, the de-stress RX she, she got, the report, should feel pretty much like her. But if it's not, um, she could take the assessment again, they, if she still has a link, still do that. Um, and if there's some part of that that you think is, is not right, then I suggest you take it as, let's say you think that you're more of an a traditionalist, and you might be more of an extrovert, sensing, feeling, judging type. Maybe that's again. If you if you email me, I can go through this. But if you want just my quick answer, if you wanted to take that again and click off the extrovert, sensing, feeling, judging type, and see that report, you could compare them and say, ah, this one's really me. That one's really me. That's the advice I have. But again, happy to um, to talk to someone in person. Very or, good. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, one other question. Is sure. there a certain age group most associated with any of these? No. Type is inborn. You come out of the womb as a type, and you, at, hopefully at the end of a very long, happy, healthy life, you're the same type. And anyone on the Zoom who's got children will know that your children are different right from birth. If you don't have children, you'll probably agree with me that your siblings were different in personality right from birth. And they stay that way. You know, the little Paul Teeger is not a whole lot different from the, the guy that you're looking at now in many, many ways. Good question, great question. So let's move on to experiencers. And these are a whole different cat. And their core drive, core value is enjoyment. So for experiencers, some common tri triggers are loss of freedom, loss of spontaneity, because these are people that really love that. And the reality is that, you know, um, everyone likes their freedom. But experiencers really like their freedom. They're not enamored by rules to begin with. And now, guess what? There's all kinds of rules. I mean, things are relaxing now with masks, and but there's vaccines that you're supposed to take. There's places you're supposed to not go. There's protocols you're supposed to follow. And I think especially in healthcare, all those protocols or most of them are still in place. So it's become more restrictive, which is something that really chafes at people who are... Um, who are experiencers. Loss of spontaneity. These are folks who like to do what they want to do when they want to do it, especially in their, in their home lives. Um, get up and go whenever it suits them. Obviously, um, a lot of those activities that they would like to have engaged in, concert going or whatever, have been canceled or changed or are or, or more anxiety producing now. So the loss of spontaneity has hit experiencers uh, particularly hard. 
What are some of the symptoms? What are the things that it looks like? Well, these people that are normally pretty happy, they're lucky and joyful, they can lose that joy. They can get more pessimistic. These folks are normally pretty optimistic. Water rolls off their back, you know, stuff happens, uh, tomorrow's another day, don't sweat the small stuff. But when they get stressed, that goes away. They can become fearful, they can get pessimistic, they can act out. Um, and those are some of the things that um, they do. They can, they can look at the future and not see good possibilities because they're not folks who really uh, use their imagination in a very, uh, imagination is not their strong suit. Being in the moment, being real, realistic and down to earth, that's their strong suit. It's not about all this imagining and thinking about future opportunities. Um, they can act out, what does it look like? I'm sorry, they act out. Um, um, behaving impulsively, 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 rebelling against authorities. This is the group that is least likely to follow the protocols, least likely to get vaccinated, least likely to um, support mandates, you know, mask mandates, and because they don't like their freedom challenge. I'm not making a political statement, I'm making an observation here. And so what do they do to, um, to restore equilibrium? Well, um, physical activity is really important for these folks. A lot of these folks, not all, but a lot of these folks have got jobs that require them to use their body. They've got a, you know, there used to be thought of that was kind of one type of intelligence, but we've learned that there are really multiple intelligences. And some people are more, you know, uh, creative, artistic, um, more in tune with music. Some people are more in tune with what they call kinesthetic intelligence. And these folks, uh, usually are really gifted in kinesthetic intelligence, meaning using their bodies, using their hands. I've got a good friend. My oldest friend is a plumber. He's been a plumber for his whole life. When he goes to fix something and put a pipe on it, he knows exactly how far to go, exactly instinctively to, not, to go to fix it, but not break it. I'm just the opposite. I mean, we're looking at a disaster if I ever get in front of a pipe. We have different intelligences. He could not be doing this presentation and I could not be working on you know, somebody's plumbing. So it's different gifts. And what I'm saying to you is that um, experiencers really need physical activities to use their body, in, enjoying nature. When I take a walk in nature, I have a wholly different experience than these folks do. They notice everything. They notice the breeze in their face, the temperature, uh, the colors of the trees, you know, the sounds of the water, all that kind of stuff. So that is restorative, that brings them back to, um, to equilibrium. Okay. Um, so that's um, experiencers and, um, I'm sorry, traditionals and experiencers. I wanna look at uh, questions about that before we move on. Well, there's yeah. a question. Are these traits normally inherited? Uh, nope. This, uh, there's no, there's no, scientific basis or research that shows that if you are sent, if you're an experiencer, you're gonna have an experiencer kid. Often these things sort of run in families, but the gene, the experiencer gene has not been identified. Um, and it's not uncommon for people to have, you know, kids that are very different from them, very different. And that's when parents go, I don't know what planet this kid's from. He's not like any of us. Um, I actually wrote, second book I wrote is called Nurture by Nature which is about personality type and children. And it's all about understanding who your children are and how they may be similar or different from you, which I think is a very important thing to understand. But it's not like if I'm uh, an experiencer, I'm gonna have an experiencer kid. It doesn't work that way. It's easier okay. when you're raising kids who are like you, I will say that, because it's easier to understand them. But we're not always blessed that way. Good question. So here's a here's another question. Sure. But during something like a pandemic, wouldn't many people of all types be triggered and have these symptoms? I think she might be referring to the maybe the experiencers and the mm -hmm. traditionalists. Yeah, you know, it's a good point. And yes, however, it's more so with these folks. For um, for <clears throat> as you're going to see in a minute, for the idealists it's not just a lack of joy, it is anxiety and depression. For um, traditionalists, some of their 
you know, what they're going to feel about is, is guilt or shame. They might be less joyful, but they're more likely to be guilt, feel guilty, shameful, uh, or, or shame. So it's, uh, it's not exclusively, but it's primarily. I guess that's, that's what I'm trying to say to you. Hope that makes sense to folks. And again, you know, when you're, when you're talking about psychology, you're never, it's not biology, it's not chemistry, it's not an exact science. It is, psychology is complicated. There's a lot of variables that make somebody psyche. Um, so these are useful ways based on a lot of science um, about how these people operate, but it's not true of every individual. Every individual is unique. Okay, so I'm gonna go, um, in a few minutes we got left, I wanna talk about conceptualizers and they're all about success. So some of their tr triggers are loss of power. These are people that are used to being in charge. People used to, used to doing things really well and now they might not have the resources that they need. Um, there are people who are very, very high achievers and all kinds of situations prevent them from reaching their goals. Um, people, who are, people who are normally very futuristic and uh, possibility oriented, they can shut down and not see options which they normally do. What does it look like? It looks like these people who are usually very self-confident can become doubtful of their own abilities um, and they can um, act out and become aggressive um, because because they're usually people who, whose emotions are usually very much in check. But now when they're in the grip, as I mentioned before, those, those, uh, their emotions sort of become childish and they can act out and do things they would never do if they were feeling, you know, feeling no, like they normally do. What are some success strategies? Well, being successful, um, taking on projects that they can succeed in, even if they're small projects. Um, um, taking an inventory of their past successes. You know, maybe not feel that successful now, but they need to remind themselves, yes, I am, I, I have achieved this in my life. I still have those qualities. Um, and, and that's an important thing. Um, getting recognition can help be helpful. Writing articles, doing blogs, um, taking on, um, uh, sharing your ideas, sharing your ideas and expertise with other thought leaders they respect. Um, some other strategies might be lightening up on themselves and recognizing that this is a big deal. They're, this is not just the normal stuff. This pandemic has, has wreaked havoc on everybody and they're not immune to that. Um, I think it's also important for these folks who are not necessarily big on relationships to try and rekindle relationships. Um, and if they're comfortable doing it, they're not normally people who seek counseling because they they're so competent, they figure, I can figure this thing out, but counseling can help these folks. And the last group, the idealists, these are folks that um, are all about, excuse me a second. Um, yeah, okay. These are folks <clears throat> who are all about relationships <clears throat> and harmony. And so triggers can be when they're disharmony. <clears throat> and I think that especially during the early parts of the pandemic where people are forced to live together that they normally don't. They get four people under a roof <clears throat> or for the more extroverted people who are more isolated. Really, this was extremely, extremely um, stressful. You know, when the great resignation happened and my feeling was a lot of people are gonna opt out because, <clears throat> excuse me, because why they do something is because it has meaning to them. And now they have to reevaluate whether <clears throat> these jobs, excuse me a second, I'm sorry. <clears throat> whether their jobs still had meaning. We talked a little bit about this. These are the folks that really get whacked with anxiety, depression, physical illnesses. And what, is, what restores them to sanity and um, equilibrium? It's connections. It's, it's relating to people. It's reconnecting with people. <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> excuse me about this. Uh, while you're uh, clearing your throat there, Paul, I just um, mention and remind people that 
if you look at your own individualized results with your four um, four types, I should mm -hmm. say I'm saying it wrong, but mm -hmm. you'll get specific um, triggers. And so all these things that he's going over, you'll get much more detail in your own report. So look, take a look at that again, and hopefully that'll shed some light on it. You'll also get strategies, a, a whole, you know, like half page of strategies that can reduce your stress. Thank you, but yeah, there, there are eight symptoms, I'm sorry, eight, eight stress triggers. And that doesn't mean that every person of that type is gonna say yes, 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 to all eight of them. But you are gonna see three, four, maybe more that are the things that really are your biggest triggers. And that's what you should concentrate on. And, and same thing for symptoms, you're gonna see eight symptoms, not all of them are gonna be true for you, but some are gonna be very true for you. And most important, you're gonna find at least three or four strategies that can help you reduce your stress. So those are the, um, that's the presentation sort of in a nutshell. Um, I think that you will get a lot from doing, you know, looking at your, your assessment results. And if you've got questions, um, I can put up, let's see, I, can't, I don't know how I can do that right now, but I can, um, I can give you my email address and welcome your uh, inquiries. It's, I don't think it's on this PowerPoint. No, it isn't, I'm sorry. It's Paul, as my first name, T, like Tiger, at speed, S-P-E-E-D, reading, R-E-A-D-I-N-G, people, P-E-O-P-L-E dot -E com. Maybe, Bud, you can put it in the chat. I'm just doing that right now. So I know you guys wanted to have a, you know, end a little before uh, the hour. So I, I've left some time for questions. Um, anybody's got anything they'd like to ask or kind of observations they'd like to make? This would be a good time to do that. And I think what I'm gonna do is stop sharing my screen so I can see some faces. Questions, comments? Um, did, did you feel like that this was accurate? I'll ask that, you know, did you get insights from this? I see some heads nodding, which is nice. Um, honestly, yes. My um, assessment fit me perfectly. It's just that I got a little off track because the details of the traditionalist, no, the other one at the other end. The I do. Yeah, the ideal the idealist really seems to fit me too. So um, I am who I am. <laughs> oh, I'm all good. You you definitely are who you are. You, are you the person who came out as an ENFJ? No, I came out as an ISFJ. Okay, and but you related a lot. You related a lot to the uh, to the intuitive feeling to the idealist. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, totally. Well, here's what I would say. What's your first name? Beth. Beth, here's what I would say, Beth. If you still have that link, take it again and take it and answer it as an INFJ because that will make you, uh, that will show you as an idealist. And then you'll have the INFJ and the ISFJ that you can look, you can compare side by side and you should find one is more than the other. Okay, I'm going to do that. It's okay. very interesting to me, the whole, you know, Good. but, um, Still, I am who I am. <laughs> Thank you. We all are who we are. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> other, other questions or comments? Um, there's a couple of comments in here. Yes, um, very interesting. Thanks for sharing the info. Um, I think the younger generation has less resilience. <laughs> um, and very accurate for me have to jump off, um, but thank you for these feedback. My assessment was so me, I was surprised how on target it was. Um, the assessment fit me very well. Would you put up the chart again or where can we find it? Um, which chart? The, which the, chart, Andrea is asking. Would it be um, the, uh, the health risk factors? But also there were a couple of people who were asking for the, uh, to take it again, she says yes. The yeah, health you, can risk factors. You, can, you can you can do that yeah i can uh, to take 
is another question. But to take it again, um, I would go back to the link that I originally sent you or it was also in an intranet article. Uh, so if you go on the intranet, you'll see, you know, um, an article about this class and taking it and you'll find the link in there. And if you just if you need it from me, just, you know, reach out to me. I'm happy to send it to you. So here's a question. Do you find people with similar temperaments gravitate with one another or maybe balance one another? Great question. I actually wrote a whole book about this called Just Your Type, which profiles each of the combinations, the, like 136 different combinations. <clears throat> the reality is that people who are of the on the four letter types, like ISTJ or whatever, most couples are have two in common. So there's fewer that have one in common, Few, fewer have none in common, some have one, most have two, some have three, and some have four in common. Um, so opposites really do attract often, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they've got the best relationships because we're attracted to somebody who is different from us. For example, let's say <clears throat> um, an extrovert is attracted to an introvert and goes, you know, she's so calm and centered. She can sit there, she can read a book. She doesn't have to be out there in the world all the time. And that's appealing to me on an unconscious level. The introvert looks at the extrovert and says, boy, he's so social, he's got so many friends, he's always having a good time. Um, I wish I was more like him. If we're together, maybe I will be that way. Again, unconsciously. And now they get together because they see in somebody, in the other person, something that they're lacking. But now it's the weekend and the extrovert wants to go out. The introvert wants to stay home reading poetry, you know? So it doesn't always work out uh, that the opposite, the, the attraction uh, based on opposites works. All, all kinds can have healthy relationships. And I think it's important to know who you are and who your spouse is, because that can help you um, more appreciate those differences, if that makes sense to people. So uh, the question about the chart, I think is she's asking for the one with, um, that shows each of the subtypes underneath the four different categories. I think that's what she oh, means. Oh, oh, that shows the different and, types. Yeah, and somebody asked, are, are we able to get the slides? You know, I wish I could do that. I can't because this is the whole full Monty here. And yeah. the, the reality is that with the internet being what it is, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, with the internet being what it is, I would have no control of what happens to this. Not that somebody that here is gonna share it, but. This is, I think this is the slide they were talking about. I think so, yes, I would bet. Yes, so thanks, yeah, I'll, yeah. Leave, I'll, I'll leave that up in case you want to figure out which one is your type from, or which temperament you belong to based on your type. That's probably the question. And, and this is a slide I could make available. I'm not worried, you know, this is not a problem that I, I, I could make available if somebody, if somebody wanted to email me, I would make the slide available to you. Let's put it that way. So you have my email in the chat. Um, and so you don't have to go, you know, scramble around to write this down. Thank you, Paul. Sure. Other questions or comments? Any last, yeah, any last questions before we close out? Okay, well, let me just let me just say thank you so much for your time and attention. Your good questions. I so respect. Um, and appreciate the work you do. Um, you're under appreciated in this world. I know you know that, but there's some of us who are just very grateful that you're doing what you're doing. So thank you. And I wish you the best. Thank you, Paul. A lot of thanks in the chat here. And I thank you all again for your time. And let me know if you have any follow-up questions or you need the link. I've jotted down a couple of names of those who need the link directly. Um, but have a great day and um, thanks, don't stress bud. out. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, too. All righty. Thanks, Paul. Of course, you want to hang for a second? Yeah.